Metropolitan Codes of Law, Code of Laws, uh, saying that any action of this board can be appealed to the Chancery Court of Davidson County for review. Um, and then I will ask for a motion to approve conducting meeting by electronic means and suspending the rules as is stated in the uh, in the agenda before you. Can I have that motion, please? So moved. Roberts moved. Do I hear a second? Second. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Uh, any public comment? Mr. Chair? Yes. Yes. I hate to interrupt, but under the governor's existing order, we have to do a roll call vote. On both of these? Yeah, on any action items, unfortunately, uh, has right. to be a real call vote. All right. Uh, okay. Let's go back to okay. the. Uh, well, no, the metro okay. works is just an announcement. Uh, okay. So, uh, Bernie, can you call the roll on the motion to approve uh, conducting meetings by electronic means? All right. Keith? Yes. Joy? Yes. Robert? Aye. Kate? Yes. Katie? Aye. All right. Uh, uh, I don't have any comments. Approval of the minutes. Um, any uh, additions or corrections to the minutes? Motion to approve the minutes. I have a motion. Do I hear a second? Second. All right. I'll call Bernie. Call the roll. Keith. Yes. Joyce. Yes. Robert. Aye. Kate. Yes. Katie. Bye. All right, moving then to um, Kent's report. Okay. Um, I thought I'd start off with an interesting item I ran across by reading Library Journal. Um, under bestsellers, biography, and memoir, uh, the 16th book on this list, and this is a list of the bestsellers going to libraries, was this little book called Dolly Parton, Song Teller, My ah. Life and Lyrics, by Robert Orman. And there's some great books on this list, and I thought it was interesting that this book was number 16, and number 19 was a book by Mr. John Meacham. So uh, congratulations, wow. congratulations, Robert. Uh, Thank you. Libraries have always been my friends. Anyway, they Thank are. You, Yes, congratulations. <laughs> so I thought that was pretty neat. Um, just a, a, a few things here. Uh, the board packet was very lengthy this time because we uh, had a number of MOUs in the minutes from last meeting. Um, but the, the data and statistics began on page 45 of your packet. And uh, those are are pretty basic that are similar to what we've had in, in the past year. But one of the things Bernie and I have been talking about is that we do need to uh, think about expanding those a little bit again as we have more people in our buildings and uh, start moving our services out. Um, but uh, we'll also hopefully see a lot more door count as, as we open more and more facilities. Um, I don't want to repeat what I provided you in the written update, but a couple of things I, I will hit is that the frozen positions, I wanted to emphasize that we are posting those positions and interviewing as quickly as we can. And one of the things uh, that's going to happen with that is that we're going to be moving people around because as we have staff who apply for jobs that are upward mobility, uh, we will have openings below them. And so uh, it's a little bit of a chess game and moving things around right now, but we are filling those positions rapidly. We do not have any uh, news on the budget, uh, the Metro budget at this point. Um, I was unaware there were going to be discussions publicly made about property tax discussions. I had not heard anything about that. And the news has been a little bit confusing and conflicting. <laughs> I see Katie smiling over the uh, the last few days, but I have had no official word uh, from Metro uh, how that might or might not impact uh, this year's budget. And the 
Our budget hearing is going to be uh, May 20th at 430. And I do not know if it is going to be uh, live or on WebEx yet, um, but we always like to have as many of you uh, attend as possible. Uh, so Could we, you repeat that date, please? Sure, May 20th at 430. And I will keep you posted um, so that you know uh, if there are any changes or if there, they would sometimes will make changes as people are adjusting their schedule. And I guess this last year we did it uh, via WebEx and I'm not sure how they plan on doing it this year. So. Joyce, that's the same night as the Carnegie Society Book Club, just because everything always happens in the same 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, but this is clearly more important. Yeah. Well, this will be, I mean, there is a time limit on this, and we'll be in and out and done on that. So, um, okay. Um, I wanted to uh, show you, um, we did send out the, uh, the video that was put together by the Library Foundation and our production services about curbside and virtual um, programming and uh we did a an edit of that and 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 trimmed it down from seven minutes to about four and a half minutes but in case you haven't had a chance to look at it i thought it was worth showing again and entering into the formal record so uh bernie can you put that up we we tested it so I'm ready when you are, Bernie. <laughs> I'm trying. I'll be right there. Hey, Bernie, we don't have any video. Audio. Or audio, pardon me, audio. Um, we tried it earlier and we had audio. I wonder if you take it down to that smaller size and try it again, if it will, will be there. Shoot. Bernie, it's Larry. I think maybe if you uh, unmute yourself and try it again. Third time's a charm. Are we good? If you are a fan of the library like I am, you can appreciate how when COVID-19 hit, we all were still able to check out books, DVDs, CDs, and all kinds of materials from our library through the gift of curbside prep. Today, we get to take a look at exactly what goes on behind our library's closed doors and see the miracle workers who have been working tirelessly behind the scenes to meet our community needs. So without further ado, Let's see our library heroes in action. Hey, I'm Catherine Bryant. I'm the manager of the Bellevue Branch Library. And today we are going to give you a behind the scenes look at what it takes to deliver curbside service at one of National Public Library's busiest locations. 
we are in constant motion keeping up with our patrons' requests. The state is too busy. It's a more physical process of grabbing the items, checking them out, bringing them to the vehicle. We've actually had to acquire a wagon just so that we could bring the high volume checkout coal vehicle to the park for the uh, process. We fulfill over 250 hold requests per day, checking for new requests at least twice a day. The minimum number of people needed for a full day, of course, is 10, and that is cutting it very close. So many of them have said they don't know what they would have done throughout the pandemic if it wasn't for our curbside service. When we talk about our library doing this and offering that, what we really are talking about is the committed, creative, brilliant library staff whose job has been changing month by month to serve all of us through this long and challenging year. We have learned that libraries are not just about books and stuff anymore. We are about information and relationships and community. Hi, I'm Lindsay Patrick Wright. I'm the manager of the Southeast branch. During normal times, our computer is busy. So we knew we were able to open for a limited opening and allow people to come in computers that our community was very excited. <laughs> we were right. We've created a number of easy to follow visual guides for completing some of the most apps for computer help. This keeps both staff and patrons safe and allows us to continue offering good customer service. We in the library system are there to help with the digital divide. I was glad to offer some type of assistance and to keep them connected and let them know that we miss them as much as they miss us. I don't know if you realize our library system purchased 7,000 ebooks and audiobooks within the first month of closing. Yeah. $70,000 were invested in learning resources and public school children to help them during this time. It wasn't until I became involved as a volunteer that I started to realize how integral the library is in every facet of our community, through literacy programs and partnerships. Well, without the library, I think people lose a uh, part of the heart of the community. Programming is an important part of what we do uh, at National Public Library. The truth is, there has not been a single day in our library not there for us in service to our entire community. When we deliver books to a car, we hear a thank you and see a smile under a mask. It means so much to us. I'm always amazed that, you know, one little thing can make such a difference to someone else. I just want to say what a lifeline the library has been for me through the last year. Seeing friendly faces has been fun to me. Thanks, Bernie. Well, Great obvious... job on the edits, too. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think it's a little bit more concise, and uh, I really enjoy it. So kind of shows what all is going on behind the scenes while we've been looking at this. So, I think it's terrific, too. I, d I don't know if you're going to mention, Ken, the article from Governing Magazine. I was really glad that you shared that. That would be this article. Um, right. There was a great article in Governing Magazine about how um, public libraries can pursue the American Rescue Plan. And actually, there have been some other articles in library uh, journals and publications. And we have a task force that uh, Lee Bouli is heading. Uh, internally, where we're, we are going to be assessing what programs we think we can apply uh, to the different ARP funds. So. Great. So, <clears throat> Kent, remind us uh, what the uh, reopening schedule is from here. Well, if we continue uh, in the direction that we're going, assuming we're able to fill staff positions quickly enough that we can have bodies in the branches. Hermitage and North are next. Um, and I know North has some work going on in it and Hermitage had some roof leaks. 
that we're working on. Uh, I'm looking for my list here is the reason I'm turning my back to you. <laughs> Kent, I can help. Um, so uh, Hermitage and North were scheduled to open on April 28th. Um, but like Kent said, um, Hermitage is having some ceiling work done. And at North, we're waiting to hire a library associate there um, because they have just three staff positions. Um, and we got those applications today. Uh, and then on May 12th, we'll open Bellevue and Green Hill. How many positions are how many positions are currently posted at Metro that we have open? Uh, Susan, do you have any idea? I'd be guessing. Not off the top of my head. I'd have to look it up. I mean, we're going through the list, Robert. I mean, it's they're they're getting we're putting some up every couple of days. I mean, it's it's going so. Um, but like I said, what happens is if you have a librarian position that's filled by a library associate then you're back filling the library associate position so and whenever possible uh we'd like to uh certainly promote from within we do have uh some uh applicant lists that are still standing from that we're able to draw on but some of these positions we'll need to have new applicants for so this is going to be a, a time when we're posting it's for more than one position. So right. if we have several circulation assistants open, for example, we may get a list of 200 people and we may have five openings, who knows? So um, it's gonna, those lists are gonna fill multiple positions. Right. Okay, anything else, Kent? Uh, those, were all, those were the main things I had. I had, I had a question about you said in your report there was a move away to revive funding for the libraries at the state level. A move by whom? Oh, Is it well, legislature or who? Well, this was this was interesting. Uh, you know, we've been working on uh, some urban library funding right. for for a hundred years. It feels like, and just before COVID hit, the gov well, I went, when COVID hit the. Uh, governor had agreed to put funding for urban libraries into the budget. And in that budget, uh, there was $3 million to be divided between the four of us. Well, we just, it was taken out as everything happened in last year's budget with the, the budget woes that everybody was feeling in, in government. And then uh, I attended the, uh, the state library uh, and archives uh, ribbon cutting on Monday uh, last week. And then on Tuesday, I received an e email from Chuck Sherrill letting me know that there was actually, uh, there had been a budget amendment submitted by uh, the state administration, the governor's office. And th this funding uh, was back in that amendment and uh, it had been put forward by the secretary of state. Awesome. And and there's one and a half million of it is reoccurring and one and a half is one time, which is which I think is wonderful. So um, so we're kind of uh, in a wait and see. And um, I made a couple of calls, but I'm not pushing it too hard because the word I get is that there's a good chance that since that is in the governor's amended budget that it will get through. So we will see. Is there a state level library department? Yes, the Tennessee State Library and Archives. And okay. they, have, they have a brand new building that I uh, just opened last week. Well, I, I knew the opening. I didn't realize that was sort of the governing. Well, it's it's under the Secretary of State's office mm -hmm. and their their duties are, are wide and of, of a wide variety, but they uh, you know, the things that come to mind typically for me as far as statewide is that they uh, manage the regional library systems throughout the state that are primarily serving rural areas. And then they also administer a number of different grants, both state and federal. And for instance, the uh, American Rescue Plan money that comes uh, from the federal level will be administered at the state library. Cool. That's great. Yeah, it's really good news. Mm -hmm. 
Good. Well, you spent a lot of time pushing on this, so I you and uh, oh the others from yeah. the Knoxville and Chattanooga deserve credit, I think. Well, we've got our fingers crossed this time. This was one of those things that just kind of came out of the blue, and it was a really nice surprise. So. Keenan, that's who I was trying to think of. Yeah, Keenan and and uh, um, <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, Chattanooga, Moret over at uh, Knoxville, and uh, so anyway, we've had a, a good group effort on this. Yeah, that's great. Corinne at Chattanooga. All right. Anything else for Kent? All right. Uh, foundation report from Sean. Hello. Um, I got home just in time. I was on my way from my um, COVID vaccine. So I, sorry about being in the car for the first part of the meeting, but I'm here now. Um, I wanted to just focus on um, particularly our advocacy work. Um, the beginning of April was National Library Week, um, which we actually had a great week. Um, each day of the week was a different feature. Um, everything from um, appreciating your library workers. Um, and so you saw some of those notes in that video. Um, then we also showcased the day in the life video for the public. Um, and then we had library giving day. Um, for library giving day, we raised over $15,000 um, and about a third of those donors were new donors who had never given before. Um, so we are interested and excited about that. And I've shared with the library, I think a lot of that is um, the appreciation that people who've um, been able to access curbside and also download books on Libby during the pandemic is really, we're seeing um, those kind of people giving who have who had not given in the past. And so there's just a direct correlation from the appreciation of the work of the library to the uh, donors. So we're grateful for that. Um, and then the last uh, part of National Library Week was it ended with Advocacy Day. Um, and uh, we started our advocacy message messages with three points. Um, one was unfreeze the um, staff positions, the 50 staff positions. Um, which happened. So we were able to quickly pull that one down and really then focus on two things. Um, one, um, the first of those two um, were um, ensure $4 million for collections. And so this is just something that Kent has repeatedly talked about is that um, the library doesn't receive a consistent amount of funds for books and materials. And so really um, asking for council to consider having that be consistent. Um, right now it comes from the 4% fund, um, but there's just a pretty wide fluctuation, which makes it hard for planning. Um, and also when we ran some stats, Bernie helped us, um, Nashville for the size of our city is underfunded compared to other libraries of our size. Um, in terms of the amount of money we get for collections. Um, so that's one part is ensure 4 million for collections. The second um, big piece that we've been pushing with our advocacy efforts um, is to um, continue with curbside services. Um, and the budget right now has um, 10 positions in it. Um, an additional 10 positions, which would allow for us to have curbside at four branches. So that's the other message that we're trying to push. Um, and um, if um, the four branches that we are um, hoping to be able to continue with curbside are Bellevue, Bordeaux, Green Hills, and Edmondson Pike. Um, and I would just say, I, I know um, you all received some communication about um, um, just contacting your council. Um, we still need help um, around that. Um, and so we just ask, um, I'm happy to connect with you all um, on that, but just would ask for um, you to reach out to me if you have questions. We would like to make sure that those four um, communities are covered, particularly the Bellevue, Bordeaux, Green Hills, and Edmondson Pike, where we'd like to keep the curbside services. 
Um, if you have any questions, just feel free to reach out. But that's kind of our, been our focus. Um, and I also want to specifically thank um, Kate um, and Katie, um, who've been helpful in just guiding that process. Um, and it also, if you all have any, Kate or Katie or anyone has anything to add to those efforts, would love to hear um, thoughts. But if you have not yet signed up, um, please look at the um, spreadsheet and um, reach out to me if you have any questions about signing up to, to contact. Hey, Sean, can you let everybody know sort of the timing for the calls and when you when you and Kent think they'll be the most effective? Um, with so um, really kind of from now over the next two weeks, we really want to have a, a pretty hard push to reach out. Um, and um, um, Kent, I don't know if you have anything. Well, else. yeah, the, you know, and again, it was mentioned in the paper, uh, but I don't think you're going to see the mayor's budget out for another week or so. It'll be out by the end of the month. So uh, I think it's important. I think it's important the message that we we've, we've targeted. But I think as far as getting into specifics, there's going to be another round if we need to uh, hammer home specifics that are in the mayor's budget that we want supported. And the other piece of this is that in the uh, council uh, budget questionnaire. Uh, they're wanting to know what was submitted to the mayor that was was not recommended. So that's, you know, they're kind of two different pieces in addition to what we're doing so far. What do you mean not rec recommended? Uh, we have budget improvements that we submitted to the mayor and he will not necessarily be funding all those, although we wish he would, uh, but what they're wanting to know is which budget, what the total amount of our budget improvements uh, came to that we submitted and which ones were not recommended by the mayor. That's it. Okay. So that way, I mean, it's, it's an interesting process and they've not always done this. I believe they did it last year as well, but it gives a broader uh, scope for the council to understand what the different departments are requesting. Got it. <clears throat> Jen, at what point do we ask that the money for collections be put in operations and not in the 4% fund? Um, we've been asking the last few years and we asked for it again this year. Um, the, I think the biggest issue with that is, or, or the biggest, not issue, but the, the biggest hurdle really is just the fact that suddenly the library budget is going to go up X million dollars um, when they when they finally get around to that. And I hope they do at some point. But I think that's the biggest thing. And they have more flexibility within the 4% and, and uh, moving that around, which is part of the issue that we have with it. So that, that would be a just one time. I, well, it would be one time, you're right, but for instance, if we did a form, if we moved $4 million into our operating budget this year, it would, unless they decided to make a reduction of $4 million somewhere else in our budget, we would, we would have an increase immediately of $4 million. And that's something that is the watch department budgets, I think it's a hard sell. I, I think we, we can make the case for it certainly, and it's logical. But I think the optics of that are, are a little bit difficult. Any other questions on the advocacy efforts? If not, Keith, that concludes my report. Okay. Thanks, Sean. Yeah, thanks, Sean. Okay, next up, uh, it is that time of the year when we uh, elect officers of the board. Um, as I indicated to you a couple of months ago at our meeting, um, I would uh, prefer not to stand, well, not prefer, I will not stand for re-election as board chair. Um, so with that uh, introduction, I will uh, open the floor for nominations for board 
chair. I'd like to nominate Joyce Thursey. Oh, Robert, why did you say it faster than I could? Robert is uh, nominating Joyce. Uh, sounds like Katie is happy to uh, second that nomination. Do I hear any other nominations? Move to the nominations be closed. Motion the nominations be closed. Um, Bernie, would you call the roll on uh, the vote? Pete? Yes. Joyce? I guess I have to vote aye. <laughs> Robert? Aye. Kate? Yes. Katie? Aye. All right. Democracy at work. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's great. I appreciate the opportunity that I've had to serve, and uh, I am very happy to pass the baton to uh, somebody who's going to do a great job. So, Joyce, congratulations. Chief, thank you. I mean, that's quite a vote of confidence, everybody. So, thanks for having that faith in me. Well, we do. We believe in you, Joyce. You're going to walk on. We know it. All right, so uh, I guess, do you take over at this point or do I finish the meeting? I don't know. What the I think it's at the fiscal year, is it? <laughs> All right, all right, I'll finish the meeting and then next meeting you can take over. Um, all right, we also need to fill the position of, what is it, Bernie? Vice chair? It's vice chair. Vice chair. Vice. All right. Kate, Katie, do you want to do it? Katie Barney. Oh, she Robert, does. I think Robert, isn't Robert vice chair now? No, I'm secretary. Secretary. Oh. And Joyce is vice chair. Yeah. Katie. I nominate oh. Katie Barney. I second. I second Katie. All right. Do I hear motion? Nominations closed. Yes. All right. Bernie, call the roll. All right. Katie? Yes. Joyce? Aye. Uh, Robert? Aye. Kate? Aye. And Katie? Aye. <laughs> Happy to have Vice is my first name. <laughs> uh, I think it is a no-brainer that Robert should continue as uh, secretary. I know that the, 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 the uh, so moved. are burdensome, Robert. I know that you work hard at this, but uh, I think it's exactly. that uh, you be uh, one of our officers. So, um, uh, Bur uh, uh, call the roll, Bernie. Keith? Yes. Joyce? Aye. Robert? Aye. Kate? Aye. Katie? Aye. All right. And I thank you. Congratulations thank you. to all of thank you. Thank you, fellow board members. Uh, you know, what they uh, have recognized? No, because I've got something to say. Um, okay. <laughs> this is my last time to be domineering. Um, I, I do want to say that what an excellent board this is. I mean, I can't think of how you could have a better board. Everybody is very passionate about the library, everybody cares, everybody's smart, everybody's involved. Um, this is a great board. And it's been a real pleasure to be not just chair of the board, but on the board for these many years. And so I, I congrat all, congratulate all of you. Uh, and, we expect, and we expect you to stay on this board, Keith, Keith Simmons. You're not going anywhere. That's, that's not my decision. That, that, that comes <laughs> higher up. Um, so anyway, all right, Katie, that's all I wanted to say. When, when is your term in? I guess it ends, I don't know. I can, I can tell you that uh, it is uh, a year from now. Oh, okay. Oh, when does my, oh, I thought you meant when does my time as board chair end? Yeah, no, I, I'm up for reappointment next year. Okay. Okay, good. Good. Okay. So, so I well, did want to take a minute, if I may, um, and for the record, publicly thank Keith Simmons for not just your work as chair, and you have been, um, I will say the best chair I've ever worked under on any of my boards. It's your leadership 
um, is to be admired and in any way to be emulated. I don't I don't think I could ever be um, as good a vice chair or as good a chair as you've always been, but you really have been a guiding light and you are such a and have always provided a calm you know voice and clear direction um, to everybody on this board and I really I just want to thank you personally but also want to thank you on behalf of everybody in the city for the work that you've done on a personal note I have to say I think everybody knows how much everybody on this board and how much I too care about the library um, I've always cared about libraries long before I came to Nashville, but my involvement with the Nashville Public Library and with the Nashville Public Library Foundation is all due to Keith and Kay Simmons. And um, I just have a personal debt of gratitude. I think I need to give you, Keith. Um, but thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your leadership. Thank you for your vision. Um, thank you for everything you've done for this library. Thank you. Amen. Well, I was the reason why I asked that question is because I think we knew Keith wants to step down, but we still need him so much. Yeah. You know, I I have always admired Keith will turn something inside out asking questions. And I love his questions. I just I've learned so much from you, you know, just watching. So we still need you here. And uh and I'm glad you would still be be there with us on the board. It may not be so much fun when I'm asking you the questions. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's gone awful nice, and uh, I thank you. You know, Katie, I'm trying to remember the story, Katie. So I, I was trying to get Katie to be foundation board chair. And what, Katie pulled me aside to believe me? No, you were trying to get me to lead a gag capital campaign for six million dollars oh, yeah. oh, yeah. yeah. which i did by the way yeah katie calls me aside in the stats as we were leaving the meeting and says are you crazy i am not i don't have time to do this i can't do this and i just sort of shrugged my shoulders and said okay that's fine and walked away and she did it <laughs> He did. He completely ignored me. It's like he patted me on my head and said, "Well, that's fine. I understand that you don't. You know, I, I understand that we're all busy." Yeah, it worked. <laughs> it did. All right. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna claim the last word here. Just that uh, you guys. I echo everything that everybody has said about Keith, but I I tell you, you you don't know how many calls that he's gotten from me. He's on speed dial and his counsel um, has been invaluable. And uh, get ready, Joyce. You're about to be on speed dial too. Congratulations. Well, it has been a pure pleasure. As I said last time, by next April, it would have been 25 years of being involved in the library, even on the foundation board of this board. And it has been in my professional life it's been the highlight of my professional life and i'm more proud of that than anything i've done um outside of my family it's uh it's been tremendously rewarding and and as i've said many times i think you know a lot a lot of us had a vision when we started all the started the foundation 25 years ago and and uh it's the only thing i ever had a vision of it actually turned out the way I thought it was, might turn out, and uh, so it's just been a just been a glorious pleasure to serve. And uh, but as I've said before, everybody has a use by date, so it's time to move on. All right, new business. Uh, this is going to be oh arts the all the arts lending library. All right. Um, you may recall a number of months. Maybe a year ago, we started talking about the fact we were visiting with the Arts Commission regarding a Metro Arts Lending Library. And our library team has been working with the Arts Commission to put this program together. And today we have uh, Ann Leslie from the Arts Commission here to give you an overview of what this is going to look like. And we also have the MOU uh, with the Arts Commission to move this forward. So Ann Leslie, you're in charge. Thank you. Um, 
I would first just like to thank you. And Caroline, um, Vincent, our director, couldn't be here, but if she were here, she would thank you for our longstanding um, partnership um, with libraries. It is certainly, um, without a doubt, um, one of our strongest. I can think of four, five, five actually, um, permanent um, artworks we have at libraries, and hopefully there will be more as we have, as we build um, additional libraries. Um, but in the interim, we have this um, new exciting art lending library project um, that we are exploring. So I am delighted to be able to present this to you today. And uh, today I'll be sharing the final design concept and an update on where we are now. So Bernie, if you'll go to the next slide. So this is a new purchase acquisition of wall hung artworks for the Metro Public um, Art Collection. Um, in early conversations with library staff, we presented the idea of an art lending library where library patrons could check out local artwork just as easily as they checked out a library book or other materials. Well, the library staff was very receptive and we decided that we would pilot this at two branches, Madison and Southeast. So to this summer, or actually this fall, we put out a call to artists and we had a citizen selection panel, which included um, Bellevue manager, Catherine Bryant, and they reviewed the submissions from our Nashville Davidson County artist and had the difficult task of choosing 60 of those artworks. They did an amazing job and you can in fact see two of the artworks that were selected there on this slide. And then as follow up to the selection process, um, Metro Arts um, was very interested in looking at the artist and who they represented. So that data that the artist provided um, was very interesting. It revealed that 24 of 35 council districts are represented. Um, of the artist, 47% identified as persons of color, 23% low income, 20% persons with disabilities, 17% seniors, 12% immigrants and refugees, and 10% LGBTQIA. We were also interested to see what um, previous contact the artist had had with Metro Arts. And we learned that 92% of the artist had not previously received Metro Arts funding. We also learned that 73% had never applied to a Metro Arts opportunity before. So th this was very interesting to us and um, helped us to see that we were reaching people um, that we, for which we'd had no previous contact in many cases. So with that completed, um, we moved on to the purchase um, of these 60 artworks that happened at the end of the year. Uh, we have since had these artworks professionally photographed, professionally framed. Um, and we've also been thinking about um, the eventual launch um, of this um, art lending library. And we had um, artwork cleaned um, at the public artwork um, cleaned at the library branches. And um, of course, one of these uh, locations is Southeast, where we have that very large suspended artwork um, from the four corners there in the lobby. So uh, what is still in progress, um, things like library um, cataloging, um, they're working on that now and um, final design modifications. So that final design is what I want to share with you now, Bernie, if you'll go to the next slide, please, in the next slide. So to give you a little bit of background, um, we started um, with site visits. And so here we are at Madison. We met with Jessica Piper and we all agreed that this um, back wall would be ideally suited for the display wall. It's a wall that you see immediately as you come in. It's to the right um, of the circulation you know, main desk, front desk area. And to activate it um, as a display space, it wouldn't dis disrupt um, much of the existing programming. Um, but then as we started um, doing that um, placement of artwork, um, we quickly realized that additional space was going to be needed. 
So Bernie, if you'll go to the next slide. So we, when we went back to Jessica, we asked her if this additional wall space on the other side of the work um, room door would be available and she indicated it was. So with those two adjoining spaces um, in mind, adjoining walls, we got to work planning for the placement um, of 30 artworks at each um, branch location. Go to the next slide, please. As you can imagine, uh, with 60 artworks and 30 at each location, there are just an infinite variety um, of possible combinations. Fortunately, Metro Arts has a contract with Art Up Nashville, an art handling company. It is headed by Duncan McDaniel, um, who has a lot of experience um, installing his own artwork, um, but also others works in galleries and museums. You know, he works, you know, all around town and actually nationally. Um, and we are very grateful for his assistance um, in helping us design um, this, this exhibit. And of course, um, we want our artwork to be engaging and eye-catching and encourage um, library users to come over and learn more. So yes, we have visual appeal and balance um, of artistic styles, mediums, orientation, sizes, and colors. We're keeping all that in mind while we're also keeping in mind um, safety and security. From our very first meetings, um, we had safety in mind both for our artworks, but also for the public. So for this reason, um, many of the artworks um, are going to have um, acrylic sheets, you know, plexiglass, um, especially those that uh, might happen to be on the lowest row. And we also um, are keeping artworks up off the ground, at least a distance of 18 inches at Madison and 24 inches at Southeast. Um, we also know that, you know, people might accidentally brush up against the artwork. And for this reason, um, we um, have three point hardware that's going to keep the artwork safely and securely on the wall, even if somebody does um, accidentally hit up against it. And that will ensure that artwork um, stays on the wall until the staff um, has been um, brought over and um, is helping them to, to, to check out. Bernie, if you go to the next one. So here is our um, design for the main display wall at Madison. So you can see it extends from um, one door to another and then to the other side of that workroom door on the right. Um, it, this has 30 artworks um, and we have signage, um, that art lending library signage, both in English and Spanish. And you'll also note um, that there are small um, object labels, identification labels with each artwork. And I'll be telling you more about those later. Um, here is a list of the 30 um, artists that um, whose artwork will be at the Madison Branch Library. Hopefully these are names of some local artists um, that you recognize. Um, Metro Arts has been doing a lot of work um, in Madison re recently, and um, for this reason, perhaps, um, we had a, a great response um, from Madison, um, artists living in Madison. Um, in fact, uh, we had 11 Madison artists who were selected, and eight um, of these artists' works will be um, permanently based at the Madison branch. And again, keep in mind, all of these are Nashville Davidson County artists. All right, next slide, please. So at Southeast, um, we met uh, with um, Lindsay um, and, and her staff there, and again, looked at what might be suitable display locations. And of course, we know that all libraries are set up differently, and we expected and appreciated um, the fact that the lending library is gonna look a little bit different um, from branch to branch. As the pilot project, um, it's great for us to be able to test out different spaces and different configurations. Well, here at Southeast, um, we identified this community meeting room um, with its back wall um, would be a very suitable space, um, very similar to Madison. You know, we have about 20 feet. Um, in this case, it's from door to window. 
And of course, this is in the community meeting room, but we do um, like the fact that it has um, those glass windows so that um, people can see through and, and see that there is art um, even when there happens to be meeting um, taking place. <clears throat> um, and if you want to go to the next slide, Bernie, yes, you'll see the display um, for Southeast. So very similar, um, but with a, a few, a few differences. Um, here, um, we decided that we would like to have four languages represented. So in addition to English and Spanish, we also have um, Arabic and Kurdish. And um, these are just placeholders for language, the languages. We will have actual professional translations done, but these are just for our planning purposes. You might um, notice that this seems like it has fewer artworks um, than at Madison, and that is correct. Um, if you'll go to the next slide. The um, staff at Southeast um, came back to us and shared with us um, another location that we might consider for a different kind of display. So that area that's circled there um, is between the front entrance and the circulation uh, front desk area. And um, we know that um, A-frames are used in this area. And we have been talking about a movable art display. So something similar to that um, kind of cart, um, but that would be um, purely devoted to the display of artwork and would provide to get people's attention and also direct them to the main display space there in the meeting room. So Bernie, if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see the um, the art display rolling carts. Um, there is the front and back. Um, um, if we were to do one, um, it would need to be about 84 inches long. And so you see the front and the back of it. There is one side of it. And if you go to the next slide, there is the other side of it. So uh, again, we have the different um, instruction, the simple instructions about how to use the art lending library in um, different languages. Um, but we've also, you know, have this up close to the front door and hopefully um, it gets people interested and they want to learn more about this art lending library. The next slide, please. Well, I have a quick question. Yes. The, the, are the pieces on display the actual ones that they can borrow? Exactly. Okay, that's all. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> and so here you see a little bit more about the construction. So it's treated wood and plywood on heavy duty casters. They would be locking. So, um, you know, there's no um, fear of them, you know, rolling when we don't want them to, but um, they, those can be unlocked and they can be moved um, if needed. The next slide, please. So here at Southeast, um, we have the other 30 artists. Um, there were three um, artists um, who were selected um, from the Southeast area, and so all three of those uh, marked with the asterisks um, are included in the collection here. So on those um, display walls, um, you saw some um, simple text, and this is that text up close. You know, we'll have, you know, clear, you know, bold signage um, that you can see from a distance that says Art Lending Library in multiple languages. And then um, as people come up closer, they'll see these very simple um, instructions that um, help to explain how, how this works. Um, and for those rolling carts, we'll additionally have the words more art in meeting room so that they will um, head over that way and, and be able to explore even more art. Um, at Madison, again, we have the English and Spanish and Southeast. Um, additionally, we'll have Arabic and Kurdish, and we will use a professional um, translation service, Lingua Links. Um, what you couldn't see really well on those um, images of the main display walls are these um, identification labels. Um, here we want to have the artist name, the title of the artwork, the creation year, um, the materials, and then the frame size. If somebody is considering if this is going to work at their house, uh, we think it would be helpful for them to know um, the, the sizes. Um, of that artwork. So these will be uh, just at the base of each uh, one of the artworks. 
Now, we certainly hope um, that the artwork um, and, and the art lending library is popular and artworks are checked out all the time. But what happens when it's all checked out or nearly all checked out? We don't want there to be blank walls. So we have this solution um, to have some graphic um, film that would have um, a, an image of the artwork. Um, and this would be a permanent, um, uh, permanently adhered to the wall, um, this image of the artwork. So that even when the artwork has been checked out, um, you know what's there and what you might um, hope to check out when it when it returns. And it also, it can be a help to the library staff that artwork is is hung in the correct location. So this um, is something that would be professionally installed by Jarvis Signs. It has a very you know great life expectancy of ten years, um, and so we you know this is used in in applications, um, retail applications all the time. So we really like the idea of being able to share the artwork even when it's checked out. You go to the next one. Um, I mentioned before about um, the thought we've given to the hanging system. Um, this three-point um, security system is one that we have used um, at other locations for Metro Public Art. We've used it at the courthouse and at the Metro Office Building with no problems. Um, it, there is a special tool for which we can provide uh, multiples uh, to the library staff. And uh, with that, um, just a simple turn at the base and it, it comes off very easily. And so with this, um, each framed artwork would be designed for both the hanging at the library as well as just a simple wire hang at, at the home. We have also um, been thinking about checkout cases. Um, we want to provide uh, some protection as um, library patrons are taking their artwork home. Um, but of course, we need it to be fairly inexpensive because we understand um, these are the things that might not, not come back and might need to be replaced. Um, so we've been looking um, locally and have some good options um, for, for purchasing these, but they would have a handle and would provide um, some good protection and make it easier for people to get their artwork safely home and safely back to the library. Next slide. So um, our immediate next steps, um, here we are in, in late April. Um, so we have been having conversations and are about to paint that display wall at Southeast. Um, it is currently green, um, but we thought painting it, you know, white, light gray, something like that is really going to set off the artwork um, much better. Um, we've been talking with Lingua Lux links about the translations. Um, we have some sample um, vinyl um, that we have um, are looking at right now and are having some conversations um, with um, Jennifer Fournier there at the library about the fabrication of the art rolling carts. Um, and then as far as the checkout, we're looking at those checkout cases and are about to make a purchase of those in consultation with the library staff. Uh, we're also looking at um, things like an information sheet, um, how to hang those kinds of things that will go um, with the artwork. And then as far as um, policy and, and promotion, um, we're, um, I know you all are looking today, or later today at the memo of understanding. And then of course, we're also working with the library's online catalog, um, as well as our Metro Arts web pages, which will have the full collection. So you see those things on a timeline, and if all goes well, um, it would be great to think that we would be installing um, late May, early June, and perhaps could, could think about a dedication event. That's typically what we do um, for our permanent um, artworks, and of course, you know, we um, have um, guidelines we have to follow, but um, if it is permissible, I know the artist would be very much interested in having um, a dedication um, event there in, in, in midsummer. Um, and then because this is a pilot program, um, we also would like to do um, some evaluation. 
um, especially, um, you know, at least about a year um, out, um, if we could, you know, pause and, you know, check out the collection and see how things they have held up, the framing, um, you know, that is something that we have talked to the libraries. And so we have a, a general plan for how we might do that kind of an evaluation after one year and then make any necessary adjustments. So that ends my presentation. Um, I will, will be happy to entertain any questions. So, Ann Leslie, these pieces become a part of the Metro Arts Permanent Collection. Am I correct in that? You are very correct. That is exactly how this is working. Well, this, yes. And will this collection expand over time or refresh over time? Well, it's a pilot program. So, yeah, I mean, it could. <laughs> we, we just haven't, you know, we just like to try this out, see how it goes, and then reevaluate with, with the library. Um, you know, certainly we could... Um, expand to other locations, but, you know, if something gets damaged, you know, we may need to, to deaccession it, you know, there's, we could talk about the possibility of another purchase from that same artist, um, but we just haven't made those decisions yet, but I think we just like to see how it goes first for this first year at least. Okay. I have a question too, so, and Leslie, what if someone just doesn't bring it back? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we've kept that in mind, um, and we have done a lot of research with other lending libraries, and fortunately, um, those libraries have let us know they really haven't had a lot of problem with that, that people have been very respectful, so that, that was good to hear, um, but then, you know, the uh, value of these artworks, we had a maximum value of 700. So this, you know, is a little difference from some of the other artworks in our collection in that the, the maximum value of any of them is 700 and most of them are in the 300 to 500 range. And they get to keep it for the same time as they would a book? How, how long, what's the length of um, well, library staff can, can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's three months with the possibility of one Sorry. renewal. You know, I was I was having this conversation in my own head, and I don't know if it's an opportunity or is it a concern. Are we worried about uh, people who are staging homes or anything like that uh, trying yeah. to get them? As long as folks have a library card, I mean, I, I wouldn't have any concerns about it being okay. used that way. I mean, I imagine these will be in I offices. Can they take out at one time? Just one at a time. One at a time. Okay, then it's not a concern. Okay. Yeah. One yeah, of the things. Not a concern. One of the reasons I'm really excited about this uh, pilot is that it's kind of a back to the future program, at least the way I look at it. Uh, in, in the mid-century, the last mid-century, art lending from libraries was fairly popular, but what they were typically lending were, were frame prints that large vendors uh, would put together and they'd sell. So their value was not that great and often the art was not that interesting, uh, at least in my opinion. And um, what, what I think is so interesting and so groundbreaking about this is that what we're really doing is not only taking great art, but it's local artists uh, with a local appeal. And we get to have a collaboration here that really pulls everything together and shows the great diversity within our community. So. Well, exactly. I completely agree, Kent. And, and we hope this will encourage people, you know, and help them to realize that collecting local art is something they can do. And, you know, this allows them to be introduced to, you know, 60 new artists, um, you know, ones they might not be familiar with. And hopefully, you know, they will explore those artists' websites and, um, and actually get to see more of their artwork. I, I will say it's going to be interesting. I'm I'm not quite as optimistic as you are about losing pieces of art, but I think that kind of goes kind of goes with it, and we'll just see kind of what that percentage looks like in, as a pilot. So. Yeah. yeah. 
what the um, libraries we talked to, you know, more than actually losing artwork, they said, you know, things happen like the frame was damaged. And, you know, we, we have a budget for, you know, replacing the frame or replacing the, you know, the acrylic um, sheet. So those are things we can manage. Uh -huh. I think it also encourages people to become artists, not yeah. just to collect art. I don't know if you all saw the, uh, was it the CBS Sunday morning segment on uh, former President Bush? just became an artist when he left office he and now he's doing the book he's just releasing the new book on immigrants you know that he's painted he just started that yeah i i saw that i thought we needed to get him for a salon next year uh so and leslie how much how much money uh actually went to artists and how were the artists chosen Yes, yeah, so I think it was about um, 26000 for this collection. I don't, I don't know the exact figure. Um, but we, you know, put out a call to artists um, for which we had over 80 um, artists who submitted um, three artworks um, for, for possible purchase. And then that citizen selection panel that I mentioned, um, and then that included um, a library representative. Um, those five individuals met and um, looked at all the information the artist had submitted and looked at the, their artworks. And from there, they chose that selection uh, panel chose the 60 artworks. Any other questions? Well, Ann Leslie, thank you. I, I think it's great that the artistic community in Nashville um, gets uh, gets some financial backing. I mean, a lot of these people <clears throat> not making a lot of money selling their art, and uh, this is this is a nice thing for them. Well, and this year in particular has been really hard for everybody and artists included. So it was nice to be able to make these purchases um, at the end of 2020. And this money came from your budget, our budget? This is from Metro Arts. This is our percent for, for art fund. Well, that's great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so. Sorry, Keith. I just wanted to say, well, Ann Leslie is still on, that um, we have just enjoyed so much working with her and the staff. I mean, they have heard every, you know, like if we had, you know, an idea or a question or a concern, um, they just embraced it. And they did so much of the work to help this be, you know, easy for us. And so I just want to give her kudos that she's been so wonderful to work with. Well, thank you. It it has gone both ways, and so this is a long term partnership. So we we appreciate you um, wanting to try this with us. So can I ask one We're last question? To it. Um, how many other libraries across the country have this sort of initiative? Um, well, you know, we found you know dozens of them. Um, it wasn't always the same model that we are we have here. You know, sometimes you know it was libraries doing this with. Um, um, art museums, partnering with art museums, and it wasn't always public libraries. You know, I tended to focus, you know, um, what I was doing on public libraries, that research. Um, the closest one, in fact, is um, the Brentwood Public Library has an art lending library, and theirs is an outgrowth of um, a, 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 you know, gallery, an exhibit um, that they have um, that is run through their friends group. And so each month they have a different artist and that um, artist donates something, which becomes part of this art lending library collection. It's a tremendous idea. Thank you all for involving us. Oh, well, thank, thank you for joining us in it. All right, let's move on then to approving the MOU. Um, Terry and Lee are going to present it. Sure. Um, Lee actually did the uh, memorandum, um, I think, for the MOU. Um, basically, this is an agreement between Metro Arts, 
and National Public Library uh, to provide the 60 works of art from three local artists. Um, the art will be available for pickup and return at both the Southeast and Madison branches um, to minimize the damage in transit. Um, I also just wanted to mention we did pick Southeast and Madison because um, the Metro Arts was looking for um, to, to serve um, customers that may not have an opportunity to be able to purchase art. And so those were why we chose those two locations and they're also at opposite ends of um, the county. Uh, so this MOU will be for one year and then we'll look at reviewing it annually, um, possibly trying it at um, some of our other locations. All right. Uh, any questions um, you want to ask um, Lee or uh, Terry? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve resolution number 2021 04.01. Um, so moved. The uh, memorandum of understanding with the arts, Metro Arts. Was that Robert? So, so, so moved. Oh. Uh, all right, Joyce has uh, moved, uh, Kate has seconded. Any other questions or comments? If not, uh, Bernie, would you call the roll? Kate? Yes. Joyce? Yes. Robert? And Kate? Yes. Did, Ro did we hear Robert? He may have had to leave. I don't know. Robert Robert needs to unmute, I think. Oh, I was on mute. I didn't I, I did say I, but I was on mute. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> and Katie, I think, had to did have to leave. Um, okay. Uh, the MOU is approved. Uh, any other business or comments? If not, we will stand adjourned. See you next month. Okay. Robert. Thank Robert, you all. Can you call me about the student request? <laughs>